it it actually sometimes being a part of these movements uh, gets us further away from what we really should be doing right now. And that kind of moves into right. the other essay that you uh, published more recently, which is why I stopped protesting and started a garden. Did you like that segue there? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it was it. great. <laughs> okay. It was great. But I was like, like every time you say the title, I wince because I, I wrote it to be provocative <laughs> and it's accurate. But I, every time the, because the activist to me still goes, what? Yeah, I know. What bullshit is I that? Know, I know. You know. And I'm like, <laughs> but anyway, that's why I left it in there. It was, no, like, no, I think it's good. I and I anyway. think I think people should maybe get a little like like some reaction, like what the fuck, and then they like read it, like oh okay. I I, I hope that they read it and like acknowledge the the be- the beauty of what you're conveying here. And I think there's a lot of other people you're you're trying to highlight in the uh, essay as well, like Paul King's North, for instance, which I think needs to be read more. Um, for sure. But anyway, I, I do want to ask you, because I know that you probably have been very concerned about the Anthropocene, about the six mass extinction, about anthropogenic climate change for years now. And you were involved in these activist circles, and you've kind of stepped away from those mass organizations. And uh, I kind of want to hear a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, yeah, so I got involved with 350. Um, uh, there was a big action. Um, I don't know, five or six years ago, uh, near where I live at the BP tar sands refinery, I got arrested with a group of people and we started the first chapter of 350 in Indiana. It was all very exciting. And I I had never been, uh, really involved in mobilizing efforts before. Um, I used to say organizing, but I've since learned there's a difference between mobilizing and organizing. Mm. And, uh, so, you know, all these, we, we did a lot of great work for several years. We, um, you know, we we brought a lot of awareness to the people in the community about the pipelines running through our neighborhoods. We, you know, we um, we brought bottled water to a community in a, a nearby community called East Chicago. Uh, it's a, here in Indiana um, that had been uh, people had been basically. Um, kicked out of their homes, their homes demolished because they uh, this housing project had been built on top of a, a, a lead smelter. And so we brought bottled water to them and, and, uh, you know, we did all this, all this work for, um, several years and more and more I was feeling not just like burnt out, but, but, but first of all, increasingly hopeless about the, impact of what we were doing versus the, you know, the, the massive kind of change, societal change that's needed in order to respond to climate change, but also just really disconnected from both the, the literal earth that I was supposed to be defending and from the people, uh, that, that I was supposed to be helping to protect. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't put this in the article, but there was, a I think it kind of came to a head. Um, we had a new member of our group who uh, was is a young black woman from this East Chicago community. She had been uh, one of the residents in this housing community. And we were trying to figure out ways to um, kind of get the more marginalized people more mobilized because one of the, one of the things we constantly struggled with was that it seems like a lot of climate activism is a activity for very privileged people. I mean, there's certainly exceptions to this, but, but a lot of, you know, retirees with disposable income and, and people like middle-class people like me, professionals who have some disposable income and disposable time. And, and it's, and for a lot of other people who are just trying to survive in this, this society and in this economy, they don't have the time or the resources or the to engage in climate activism, right? There's more immediate concerns. So uh, this young woman brought to us a proposal that we um, that one way to try to foster a relationship with this impacted community uh, and and gain their trust and so forth was to bring. Uh, raise money for and bring them toiletries because this was something the community really needed. 
And out of the group, I'm going to confess, nobody was more opposed to this than me. Because I could not... uh, The connection between the toiletries and saving the planet was too extent too tenuous to mm-hmm. extend it for in my mind mm-hmm. and um and we ended up not doing it and she ended up actually leaving the group and it, to this day I, on one level i still believe i was right that like the mission of 350 is you know raise awareness about climate change and 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 you know and create uh, you know new policies that are going to impact, um, you know, fossil, uh, fossil fuel production or, or the transition to renewable energy and so forth. But that goal is so far removed from the everyday lives of the people who are being most impacted by this, uh, by not just by climate change, but by our, our, our capitalist society that, you know, I was, I couldn't make the connection. And, um, and so (laughs) I I later came to see this as as just, not just our group, but it's symptomatic of the whole kind of mainstream environmental movement, which is more and more disconnected from the actual people that we're supposed to be fighting for and from the actual earth that we're supposed to be, uh, protecting. And, in a way, these in a way, climate change is just too big of an idea. It's too abstract, and and it's only people like me who have extra time, extra resources, who have time to sit around and. T- I mean, even this even this conversation, you know, and and talk about these things. This is a priv- This is I can do this because I'm privileged, and other people need food, and they need shelter, and they need. They need some beauty in their lives, and they need, you know, I, um, I I'm gonna sh- I'm gonna shift gears real quick here because recently you uh, uh, did a, a like a an update, an audio update, and you talked about a, a subscriber who had left, um, you know, stop sub- stop supporting you, and had gone said they wanted to support uh, people who were writing about post doom, which is a topic that. I think we're actually talking about here. Yeah. And um, um, I just thought, and at the same time, at, at that time, you, you just gone back from Brazil, you know, and you had, you, you were talking, you know, you're doing this interview, an interview with, with Mirna and, and, and talking about um, the, the festival was the oh, more love, less capital yeah. festival, you know, yep. incredible, incredible event where, People are are coming together as a community and providing food and clothes and haircuts and to to homeless people and also music and dancing and mm-hmm. you know and political education and just incredible and I thought I thought what the fuck do they think post doom is <laughs> if not that you know yeah. what. what if it, if it's unless it's just a bunch of white guys sitting around congratulating themselves on being so smart that we figured out that the world is ending, you know, I'm not having any interest in that. That was fun for about five seconds. Yeah. But there, you know, what comes after that, and that, what comes after that is people reconnecting with each other and with the with the literal Earth, not with the planet Earth, with the little literal place where they live. And and finding new creative ways outside of capitalism to feed each other and take care of each other and love each other, I mean that's that's what it is. And um, what we were doing in 350, I mean I don't regret anything we were doing. I think it was all good and it was fun. But that is not <laughs> raising middle class people's awareness about about climate change is not where I want to focus my energy right now. I'm I'm much more interested in doing something that involves uh, connecting with real people who are in need and connecting with the place where I live and feeding people, growing food, getting my hands dirty, um, you know, and, and doing this in a community that that's what's what's inspiring to me right now and that is really and, and you know what and provi- 
and finding a way to get some toiletries to the people in East Chicago. I mean, that's that's real. Yeah. And, and climate change is real, too. But honestly, I it's too big. I can't do anything about it. You know, um, yeah, uh, I'm glad there are people who are who are fighting that fight and, and doing that. But um, in the process in the process of me trying to do that, I lost sight. And I think it's easy to lose sight of the people and the actual planet. Yeah, um, that's how we get these crazy ideas. Like, um, geoengineering. It's like, well, at some point, <laughs> yeah, you know, where we're trying to save the planet, and we end up killing it by trying to save it.